Hey, it's Mike here, and today, the calcification of the pineal gland, in particular, does fluoride intake from things like fluoridated water and toothpaste actually mess with this tiny little pine cone-shaped part of the inside of our brain? Or better yet, from a spiritual perspective, does it close our third eye and prevent us from ever reaching higher states of consciousness or seeing 20th dimensional beings? You don't know how many dimensions there are. Also, we have to ask a ton of other questions like, is the calcification of this gland a natural part of the aging process? We're gonna investigate different populations in different times to get an answer. But most importantly, we're just gonna be looking at a bunch of science and trying to think critically about this. And really, I don't have any skin in the game. I don't really care if fluoride is good or bad for you. Probably some good, some bad, and we'll see what we found. You know, in the end, is it bad to have your pineal gland hard? We're gonna find out. <laughs> As somebody who grew up around, for a lack of better word, some hippies, it was clear to me from a young age that if you got exposed to fluoride, then you would definitely calcify your pineal gland and lose any chance of gaining psychic abilities at some point. It's why children are so sensitive to spirits after all, because their pineal gland is an untouched virgin little gland. It's also worth mentioning the mainstream concerns in that the pineal gland is your circadian rhythm regulator, it helps you sleep properly, so we need to make sure that it's doing all right. And it really is your third eye in the sense that it has photoreceptors. It takes in some light and makes some melatonin if there's a lower amount of light so that you can go to sleep. It also regulates the menstrual cycle, which is super interesting, figures out how many days have gone by. The learning is just beginning and looking to this study, get this, the amount of uncalcified pineal gland that you have correlated to the amount of salivary melatonin. So we gotta keep that functioning. This brings us to the basics of the pineal glands calcification process that occurs from this study, parenchymal or organ-based calcifications in the pineal gland are also referred to as brain sand and are even used as an anatomical landmark in radiographic studies. And you can see an image, boom, right here. It's like a little pea lit up in the middle of our brain. And I'm not a huge fan of quoting WebMD over the medical literature, but they just said it well here, quote, unlike most of your brain, the blood-brain barriers don't fully protect the gland from the rest of the body. Instead, it receives a significant amount of blood flow second only to the kidneys. Maybe that wasn't the best quote actually because they said blood-brain barriers plural. Pretty sure there's just one. So you can imagine over time from the blood, things can build up in the organ. And of course that includes calcium and fluoride and fluoride so much so that it appears to amass more fluoride than any other organ in the body. Oops, pineal gland. And while it's clear that calcium is doing damage, the concern with fluoride is that because it's more toxic than calcium, it could be doing more damage. But let's keep a level head and learn some more about fluoride itself. Well, it, it appears that we've been adding it to our water in the US since about the 50s. And even then, it was controversial and was deemed a communist plot to control us chemically. And today it's in about 70% of the US water supply and clearly it hasn't turned us all communist. <laughs> Seize the means of production. Seize the means of production. Why are we adding it to water? Well, when tooth enamel damage is still microscopic, quote, fluoride promotes replacement of the lost mineral, helping to reverse the decay process. It also lowers oral acidity levels, which helps prevent cavities. And as this paper mentions, there are a ton of studies, especially before the 90s, when we didn't have as good of dental hygiene everywhere. You know, over 100 studies showed about a 50% reduction in cavities when fluoride was added to water. And initially the US probably added a bit too much because they ended up with some dental fluorosis in children, about 40% of them, you get little kind of white spots in your teeth. Thankfully, they're generally not permanent. And bouncing back to this paper, quite shockingly, they are claiming that in terms of UK money, a pound spent on fluoride in water prevents 20 pounds of dental issues and other health issues down the line. And what many people don't know is that the natural water in the ground can contain pretty dang high levels of fluoride depending on where you are. And from this map, you can get an idea. This isn't a perfect one, but it shows some of the hot spots. You know, an ideal water level is considered 0.7 parts per million or milligrams per liter by our authorities. And at this point, I really wanna investigate the question, is the calcification of the pineal gland natural? 
I mean, going back to 1918 when everyone was worried about the Spanish flu, others were publishing calcification in the pineal gland in New York where levels are not high naturally. But this makes me wonder what are the population levels around the world. And from this paper, they're at least claiming that a general global rate is around 70% or 70% of the world has a calcified pineal gland, ouch. They point to Iran and Ethiopia and black people in the US, 70%, 70%, 70%. And I would also add from these other studies, Saudi Arabia, 65%, this US sample, 60%, Iraq, 68%. And they also mention that Turkey is up there as well. And yes, from this paper, we're looking at around 70% of people with a calcified pineal gland there. And you can see the age chart, it even gets up to heck 60 or around 30 years old. However, every area that is mentioned, I just happen to notice is a little bit higher potentially on the natural groundwater fluoride level. From this paper, Turkey's natural fluoride levels were, you know, often up to three times higher than our upper limit. They also mentioned some interesting cases of dental fluorosis in villages around a volcano, so it's a geological phenomenon. And now we get into the anomalies, which will start opening our mind more than your third eye ever could. In addition to areas that just have way lower rates than 70, like Brazil from this 2013 study, they land at about 18 and percent average, but look at the map, not a high fluoride zone. Oh my gosh, but still knocking out the idea that you have to be up around 70%. We then have this study on black and white people in the US in the 1970s and whoa, their levels are way lower, 10 and 15% on average across ages. So perhaps that decade between 1960 where it became widespread to have fluoridated water, it just didn't catch up yet. That study also mentions 10% rate in the Japanese. I was like, holy crap. And it turns out from this map, it's a high fluoride zone. So I was like, what the heck is going on here? But it turns out that map is not the most accurate. Like it's definitely not over like six parts per million. However, I can find studies showing that it matches about what the fluoride level in our water is when we add it. However, that varies and they treat their water so it doesn't go above 0.8 parts per million of fluoride. I don't know when that happened based off my English language searches, but we're getting an interesting profile here. We have some conflicting information, but let's just get to the main question at hand. Does fluoride exposure calcify your pineal gland? Does it actually make it hard? Fluoride level in populations at different times and places in the world, it seems like it might, but, 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 biochemically, absolutely not. Calcification with calcium appears to need to occur before the fluoride can then be adhered as well to that little poor gland. As this paper mentions, research on tissue, calcium, and fluoride levels, quote, suggests that the accumulation of fluoride in the pineal gland is rather a secondary phenomenon to the primary calcification of this organ. So you need calcium to capture the fluoride. It's kind of like calcium lays down the highway for fluoride to travel. And now another total wrench thrown in the fluoride gears. It turns out that a lot of studies done on calcified pineal glands were in areas with low fluoride water levels. As they say, the accumulation of fluoride in the gland occurs even when the organism is not exposed to particularly large amounts of fluorine compounds in the environment. All of this points to the idea that it's definitely not fluoride causing it, doesn't mean that fluoride can't be harmful later on, but this brings me to my main theory around this topic, and that is that it's more or less connected to atherosclerosis and the hardening of arteries. Now people think that artery calcification is natural, but it doesn't have to happen. Certain populations have lower amounts, like the Okinawans in Japan, etc. But to support my idea from this 2021 study, pineal calcification is associated with brain atherosclerosis. It was also associated with smoking, which heavily drives atherosclerosis. And for another one, I've done an entire video or two on the connection between artery clogging in your lower back and heart disease and spinal disc degeneration and all of that. And looking at this study, they found that pineal calcification was associated with disc degeneration and aorta, AKA main artery atherosclerosis. 
So the connection is absolutely there, and it's worth noting that a lot of things happened between the 70s and 2000s when black and white people in the U.S. tended to go from 10 to 15 percent pineal calcification, at least according to that smaller study, all the way up to about 70 percent. Our diet became worse, it became more sedentary, obesity rates went up. You know the story. Everybody tries to pin it on a single thing, but that's, that's the story. Another supporting point is that males are roughly twice as likely to have a calcified pineal gland, which is ridiculous but men are also twice as likely to suffer from a heart attack. So men eat horribly, they eat way more animal fat and they'll eat more sodium and calories and on and on. And of course, I just have to mention the amazing results of Dr. Esselstyn putting people on a whole food vegan diet who had severe heart disease and just seeing it stop in its tracks is quite amazing. So I think diet plays a huge role and we'll cover that more in a second, but I do wanna mention the heart disease connection with dental here as well. I mentioned it in a previous video, but the inflammation caused by dental issues can increase your risk of heart disease here as well. So being really afraid of fluoride toothpaste and fluoride in general as well, like dodging that all together could increase the risk of cavities, increase oral inflammation and systemic inflammation, and then lead to perhaps some more advanced artery <laughs> calcification and calcify your pineal gland faster. Total speculation, but my final point on heart disease specifically, is that we saw that interesting dip in way older people having a lower pineal calcification rate, and perhaps that represents the people who have simply not died of heart disease. They have survived heart disease, and it's almost like a pineal gland could be an indicator for that. And also have to mention that various brain issues like dementia are associated with pineal calcification as well. From this study, yes, these brain calcifications, including the pineal gland, are associated with neurodegenerative diseases, such as Parkinson's, Alzheimer's, etc. And from this one, it's also associated with stroke. Not good. And while there are some differences in the process of calcification, I think it's important to look at general risk factors for artery calcification. From this paper, risk factors for it include hypertension, lipid abnormalities, we're talking cholesterol, diabetes, and obesity. These are all things that are driven by lifestyle and diet. And I have to mention, you know, various vegan populations can have 75% lower high blood pressure slash hypertension. They'll also have way lower cholesterol across the board as well well as, you know, from this paper, 78% lower risk of all diabetes and finally averaging the normal BMI when other diets don't. And from this paper, chronic kidney disease is also associated with calcification. Yet oftentimes in the literature, a plant-based diet is proposed as a treatment to chronic kidney disease. So it seems like a really good strategy is to have a really good diet, healthy lifestyle, it'll not eat too much salt, and then worry about getting too much fluoride after that. And quick note on psychic powers, if having an uncalcified pineal gland gave you psychic powers, 30% of us would, would still be psychic and in certain other populations, like even higher, like 80%. And this brings me to fluoride and circadian rhythm. Could it be that fluoridated water is actually affecting like how we sleep? And I will say, interesting thing, the pineal gland calcification could play a role in why older people do not sleep as well because their pineal gland becomes less effective. It also shrinks, things like that. This Canadian study looked at people who were or were not drinking water with fluoride and then looked at their sleep and the results were mixed. Higher fluoride was associated with not getting enough hours of sleep. There was no association with daytime tiredness and no association with frequency of sleep problems that actually trended toward less sleep problems, but was not statistically significant. And huge point, as this other study from the same area shows, urban areas in Canada are over four times more likely to fluoridate their water. This could be a city effect then, you know, urban areas have more artificial light and more noise that could keep you up and wake you up. And they also measured the levels of urinary fluoride, and they found that people who were drinking the water with fluoride were 10 times higher than those that weren't. And I think that this is a hint that fluoridated toothpaste is probably not having much of an effect, whether you're concerned about all of this, because a lot of those people who weren't drinking fluoride were probably using fluoride toothpaste, yet their levels were, again, 10 times lower. And I did double check this for you guys, and this study does confirm that toothpaste did not increase urinary fluoride. Good to know. We also have this 2019 US study where higher fluoridated water was associated with more sleep apnea and later bed and waking time in adolescence. Sounds very scary. It also reported lower snoring, which could be from less deep sleep. 
Housewives everywhere are reaching for fluoride to keep their husband's nose quiet. And I bet the city effect is even more powerful in the US because Canadians are super nice. <laughs> I feel like my pineal gland could be completely calcified. Is there anything I can do? Well, first of all, I would just say that a lot of people's sleep problems are directly related to like artificial light, which actually is your pineal gland working well. So of course, getting away from blue light at night and then being exposed to the natural sun in the morning, first thing can really help there. So is there any evidence that some type of fluoride induced pineal damage could be reversed? Well, we really only have rodent studies, which you know I don't like. We have this one. They gave different combinations of no fluoride, fluoride food, fluoride water. And well, it appears that the fluoride water group didn't have any difference. The fluoride food and water, when that was stopped, pineal gland cell counts increased. So that indicates better functioning. So I don't see a really strong case for our normal water levels doing any damage, but if you're getting fluoride toothpaste and getting that dental benefit there, there's no risk in not getting fluoride from water because you're already getting it exposed to your teeth. And then of course you're spitting that out. You got to swish it out. But if you want to get it out of your water, unfortunately an activated carbon filter doesn't actually do the job. You need to be doing things like RO or activated alumina. In the end, we do not have all of the answers on this. We have some hints from populations, but it does seem that calcification has to happen before the fluoride does its damage. And I do think there needs to be an emphasis more put on just stopping that calcification of the pineal gland, fluoride or not, because that makes it less effective. You know, we don't want our pineal glands turning into little sugar dipped almonds either way. And in terms of water, I'm definitely not gonna get OCD about it, but you have nothing to lose if you're so privileged to be removing the fluoride from your water. Thankfully, like 97% of Europe doesn't add it. But at the same time, the case for it being really dangerous at these levels is pretty low and ambiguous, but the dental benefits are absolutely there. So just adding it to a population could lower death from heart disease, even by preventing cavities. But if enough people are just brushing their teeth with fluoridated toothpaste anyway, then it's not gonna matter. Anyway, you can comment down below on how you think I'm totally crazy for even using fluoride toothpaste, but hey, the whole thing that sparked this was that paper that I responded to Liver King with that was talking about how vegans are marketed non-fluoride toothpaste, and that could be a risk factor for them specifically getting cavities. Anyway, enough rambling on my part. Let me know what you think about all of this actually, and feel free to like and subscribe. I learned so much researching this video. I hope you did too. So if you want to support me on Patreon, you can. And as always, thank you for watching and see you in the next one.